You are listening to Harmony Sermons at Harmony Church in Sumter, South Carolina. And we love the fact you decided to join in on listening to this sermon today. But we also realize that there is no substitute in connecting with others. If you have any questions about visiting church, or if we can connect you to a local church wherever you are, please visit us at HarmonyChurchSumter.com. Cheers, and let's begin. Well, hey, we are in the book of Titus, if you, if you haven't been with us for a minute. And it's been a good book, and we are finally in the last chapter. And I'm telling you what, I've learned a lot just going through this. I love that our church, we walk through the scriptures. And one of the things we've seen is, in the book of Titus, the way, to, the way Paul is writing to Titus as he's taking this book to Crete, is he starts off in the smallest location, the leadership, then he backs out and talks about, okay, how should Christians act amongst Christians, and now today he's going back out even further, and he's going to talk about how should Christians, how would the people in Crete, which translates real well to us consequently, how do we treat the world around us? Now, (laughs) I find this to be a very interesting uh, conversation because I think a lot of us have opinions on the world, don't we? Uh, we, Here's what I want to do real quick, just as a a little fun thing. If you have an opinion on something, I'm about to say, just raise your hand and let me know you have an opinion. It could be a good opinion. It could be a bad opinion, okay? Y- y'all, some of y'all are already with me. Okay, if you have an opinion on Bluey, where are you at? Bluey. Yeah, da 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 Yeah, we got that. Some of y'all, I don't know, get grandkids, okay? Or get kids. All right, so some of you, uh, how about this? Any y'all got opinions on fast food right now? You got to take out a loan to go to Chick-fil-A, don't you? How about this? Um, some of you, you will have an opinion on here. Some of you would be glad you don't. How many of you have an opinion on your homeowners association? Anybody got an opinion on that? I got a couple. So most of y'all steer clear, okay? How about this? Any people in here got an opinion on uh, the Sumter County School Board? Oh, we're getting a little... Okay, I got, I got some, some groanings come from there. How about this? Anybody got opinion on Joe Biden in the room right now? Let's just, just own it. So, hey, this is church. You can't avoid stuff, okay? Any of y'all got opinions on Donald J. Trump in the room right now? Let me see. All right, see, y'all got opinions. We all got opinions. Here's the thing. When it comes to your opinions, how long does it take before your opinion becomes emotion? Think about that. How long does it take? It takes a split second. Some of us, are, we, we just fell in our spirit. Our opinion go into an emotion just in a couple words I just said. I felt it even as I was writing it. And if we don't know what to do with our opinions, one, one truth is this. They always get hijacked by our emotions. And some of the most foolish things I've ever seen, heck, that I've ever done have been because my opinions got involved with my emotions and they made a baby called sin, okay? Like, that's what happens. And so what Paul's doing today is he is giving a game plan for what we are to do with our opinions. And the game plan is for Christians who live in a culture who's not for them. Are we qualified for this? Yes. And we're going to see, ultimately, there's, there's really only four game, four, four game plans. There's only four plays in this game plan that, that Paul's about to roll out. But here's the tension I have today. You ready? Here's the tension. Here's the tension. I have to get up here. We have to talk about Scripture. And I'm not allowed to teach you anything new. I literally can't. I literally, I look, look, uh, go, go to Titus chapter 3. And then if, if you're in there, we're going to start in verse 1. What does it say in verse 1? remind them to be. Today is a reminder sermon. That's what this is. This is a reminder. I think it's very interesting when you hang out with preachers and such. They're always like, we got to come up with that that new thought and we got to make it catchy so it will look good on a t-shirt. But you know, the fact is there are no new thoughts when it comes to Christianity. All the thoughts have been given in Scripture. There's new ways of understanding the thoughts. There's new ways to apply them in our context. But the thoughts are all there. That's what we're called to do as pastors is to preach the old truths. And today we're going to do that. And he says what we do is we remind of something today in order to navigate a toxic culture. Now, reminding is helpful, but it doesn't mean that it's easy, correct? Reminding is helpful, but it doesn't mean it's easy. What I mean is... Back in December, my kids wanted to play. Um, We wanted to go outside and play. I was sitting on the couch, and I went to get off the couch, and then I immediately rocked back onto the couch. I was like, what has happened to my body? Because I had managed over the last few years to put on an obsess of like 70 pounds. 
And I just remember sitting there, and Dan hits me. He's like, hey, I want you to preach this sermon. All right, what are we talking about? Willpower. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Lord. All right, I'll preach to myself. But that's actually what happened because I, I had to lose weight before. And in that moment, I was reminded of the path that lay before me. And that path didn't look like pizza and Bojangles, right? The path looked like grilled chicken and venison and cutting carbs and counting calories in order to get there. Because see, when you're reminded of something, the, the fact you're reminded doesn't make it easier. It just means you know the way. And that's what he's telling us today. Here is a reminder for you. Now, what I want you to see is what he reminds us of. Look at verse 1. We're going to go back there. Remind them to be, there's your word, submissive to rulers and authorities, to be obedient, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to avoid quarreling, to be gentle, and to show perfect courtesy to the world and all people. There you go. That's all you have to do, everybody. That's it. You want to be a good Christian, just do all those things. But, but, but I think if we break this down and step into it, we'll see that this, this is a very important reminder. Just like where he started with the church and he started with leadership and then he moved outward, he does the same here. He says on the front end, this is what you got to do. You got to be submissive to your rulers and authorities. Why do you think he starts here? I'll tell you why. Because that's exactly where we don't start. Humans do not start from a place of submission. You know how I know? Because I have three little kids. All right, your three little kids, they learn dada, then mama, and then no. And once your little kid learns no, it's like the new favorite word. Who's daddy anymore? Hey, you, like, how many of y'all, you felt like there was a season where the only word in your house from your kid was just no? Because you don't have, I didn't even teach my children no. Where did they learn it? But they knew it because it's buried in them because we're all sinners. And our default posture is rebellion. Don't let anyone ever teach you that we are naturally good people. We are naturally sinful people. And, it's, and because we're just reflecting our first parents who in the garden, God said, listen, you could be with me. All you need to do is just not do this one thing. What did we say? Nope. Brought sin into the world. See, Paul knows this. It's truth for us. We have an authority problem. And we need a game plan. And I get it, because sometimes we look at the authority and we're like, I could do better with my eyes closed on a unicycle. I understand that. But we have to have a game plan. And the game plan is this, number one, remember to be submissive and obedient to authority. And we, we did make mention of this when we were talking about marriage earlier, but it's here for all Christians, and that is this. Submission is something we give. It's something that we willingly give. It is, I'm going to comply out of the willingness of my own being, which is different than oppression. Oppression is when it's taken from you. So what Paul says here is, you be submissive. And actually, if you look back at early Christianity, when, when Christianity was first birthed from Christ, most people thought it was another form of Judaism. But what started to make it very distinct was one unique quality one unique quality that really started to make them stand out was how much Christians were not willing to use force. What we're not saying is that Christians are passive people. But what it was saying is Christians in their culture, instead of stepping up and rioting and creating chaos for whatever reason, unlike the Christians in the other surrounding areas, they were actually being obedient and submissive. This makes no sense. They're obviously not a part of Judaism and all the other religions around here. This must be something different. This is one of the core qualities that identified us as the early church. It's the fact that we understood how to navigate government tension. Now, I say all that, and, and, and I hear my other side of me over here speaking. So I'm going to speak to my other side because I think this is also true. Submitting to the government does not mean you're sinning for the government. That's important. We're called to submit to the government, but not sin for the government. In that same early Christian church, the Romans would get together. The Roman Empire, they would get together and they would do forced religious sanctioned practices, which looked like this. They would call Christians or everybody up and they would say, listen, you need to cast this incense towards Zeus or whatever god of the week it was. Or 
at the image of the likeness of Caesar and you need to declare him as your king and lord. And at this point, the Christians were brought up there and the government was telling them, you worship another god. And as you may already know, what many Christians looked dead in the Caesar's face and said, no, Jesus is Lord. And there are more times than I could even find where records indicate Christians were killed in mass because they wouldn't pinch some incense into the fire. I mean, think about it. That'd be really easy for us to justify today, right? Like, I'm just going to pinch some incense. I don't even have to mean it. They said, no, we will submit to the government. We will not sin for the government. And it was at that moment when the submission turned into oppression. And we're like, well, what if that happens? Is that, is that a path that can lay forward for us? I don't know. I'm not a prophet. I'm not even going to try to be that. But I do know this. Oh, you try to oppress some Christians. Because you know what's going to happen when you try to oppress some Christians? You're going to make some more Christians. That's how it works. The church is founded on the blood of the martyrs. Right? So, so when we look at this, we look at this whole thing and we realize that, yes, oppression is a possibility out there. But on top of that, we're supposed to be submissive. And it's easy for us just to camp out on the government, but how many rulers and authorities here is he telling us to be submissive to? All of them. That boss that really frustrates you. Or if, if you live with your parents, the parent who just doesn't get it, right? Like we're supposed to submit to everyone. And I think about that and I'm like, why? Why, why are we supposed to do that? Well, he actually tells us we're to be submissive to rulers and authorities to be what? To be obedient to be ready for every good work. That's why we play nice in our culture, because we have something our culture needs. And when we can be ready for every good work, we can hold up the gospel. And here's just the truth. No one wants water from a dirty well. And if we're people who are seen in public, and if, if we're seen as people who are always antagonistic and always have something mean to say about someone over us, or always fighting back, people are going to start avoiding us. People are going to start doing that. And what we're called to do is actually the opposite. We're supposed to be ready to do good works. Be so focused on that. It's very interesting when we read Scripture, it says we were created... We were God's handiwork, created for what? Good works. That's Ephesians 2, chapter 10. That's why we're made. Some people are like, well, I was made because God was lonely. He's Trinity. He doesn't need anything. I was made because God needs something to love. No, you were made because God's going to do a big work of you as salvation, and then he wants you to do big works in this world to give him glory. That's what this is about. That's what it's about. And how are we to be ready? It says right there, always. It says we're to be ready, which indicates that we're in a state of readiness. There's a difference between getting ready and being ready, isn't it? Sunday morning, hey, baby, we got to go to church. Okay, I'm getting ready. And we're supposed to be ready. Some of y'all have had that conversation, right? But that's kind of the thing. There's a difference. We're supposed to be ready. And when it comes down to it, I think that this means we're not supposed to just be a neutral citizen in our, in our government. We're not supposed to be a neutral United States citizen. We're not supposed to be a neutral citizen of the, U, of the world. We're supposed to be a net positive on this world. We're supposed to be people who've actually planned and prepared beforehand to bless those around us. We have a game plan for it. Now, the thing is, we're really good at doing this when it comes to bad things in our life. We're really good at making a game plan when it comes for the bad things. Like I know in this room, there are quite a lot of men who have, and women who have their CWPs. Harmony is probably the safest church in Sumter, I think. <laughs> Congratulations. All right. Because we plan for that stuff. Some of us, you have insurance for your insurance. You're like, I have backup insurance in case the main insurance doesn't. We plan for the bad things. Christians plan to do the good things. That's what he's called. We have to position ourselves for that. So when that homeless person approaches you, I'm preaching to myself, right? Oh, I'm sorry, I don't carry cash. Well, maybe it would be helpful if I put a dollar in my wallet. I don't know, a dollar can't even get you anything at McDonald's. But maybe I should just prepare myself to do a good work. Or, or maybe when you're in Aldi and you've got one thing in your hand, you know? 
and that person cuts in front of you with 20 things in their buggy. And now you're going to wait because there's only one line in Aldi, okay? You're like, what do I do? You be ready to do a good work. A verse that has really affected my life in a lot of ways is Philippians 2.3. And oftentimes when I find myself not wanting to do the good work or, or coming slow to the plate with it, I will say this in my mind, and that is this. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. That's how we're supposed to see every single person. Because the fact is, we miss every good work we're not humble enough to see. And, see, living the best under authority, what we're seeing is this. Yes, it helps us in the government, but it also helps us get along with our fellow citizen. It helps us when it comes to the people around us, which is about where Paul's about to take it. He says in the second half of that verse, um, he says, remember, um, when it comes to those around you, he says to speak evil of no one and avoid quarreling. So the second thing we need to remember is this. Remember to be selfless to the people around you. This is difficult. I find this one to be more difficult than the first, if I'm going to be honest with you. And he breaks this down into two different ways. Two different ways that we're, that we're selfless. The first one is that we don't do two things. We don't speak evil of anyone and we don't quarrel. One time I was in Charleston, I was in college, I was on a date, we're going to the movies, Somerville, we go to the movies, not a whole lot of people in there, I got my date with me, I'm super excited because where can this go, right? And while we're in the movie theater, a girl pulls out a black and mild cigarette thing, okay? She starts in the movie theater, lights it up, and starts smoking, to which that's not enjoyable when I'm just trying to watch a movie. But what, I mean, okay, well, my date was like, you just going to sit there like that? <laughs> oh, okay, I didn't know. She said, I'll handle it. Okay. <laughs> she gets up, walks outside, walks back in. I was like, what would you do? The, the, the people who run, the manager comes in there, goes up to the person, put that out. She puts it out. Okay, we're through. Manager leaves. She pulls out another one. This girl is, is, a, is a black and mild machine. She smokes the whole thing down. My day is just like livid. And then I'm just, at this moment, I'm like, I just want to be out of this movie theater right now. Just get me back to my dorm room where everything is secure. So finally the movie's over, the car's in the parking lot. All I got to do is make it from here to there. And I got my date. We're going out there. And all of a sudden I hear, oh, no, you didn't. I'm like, what, what just happened? What? No, I didn't. See, women, guys, you may not know this, women have this thing. They can just like look at each other and communicate paragraphs of information. <laughs> and evidently, while I was just thinking about, you know, Squirrel, she was giving this paragraph explanation to this woman about how horrible she was. And this woman says, no, you didn't, and starts charging us across the parking lot in Somerville. I'm running. I'm like, get in the car. She's, I mean, she's like, yeah. I'm like, give me the keys. Give me the keys, the, the door knocker. I'm sitting there like this. This lady's charging me. I'm watching this. I'm putting the keys in the door because the door locker wasn't working. I get it open. I shut it. I run around the other side just as the woman gets to my car. And she stiletto drop kicks the side of my car, full on dents it in, in Somerville parking lot. We drive away. And I look at her and I was like, what just happened? Now listen, I don't know what happened. <laughs> but I do know this. When things are bad, sin always makes it worse. When things are bad, sinning always makes it worse. And that's what happens when we speak evil of those around us and when we quarrel with those around us. So let me ask you, who is your stiletto-wielding, black and mild person? You all have them. You all have that person who gut punched you. That person who betrayed you. That person who you used to look up to until you got to know them. That person you used to follow. That friend that you used to have. Listen, we all have that, don't we? And I'm going to tell you what, I think these, these hurt so much because we've been offended to such a deep level. What he's calling us to do is when it comes to these people, 
We're selfless toward them. That's difficult. Now, just like what we said with the government, it's important to make a note here. Selflessness to those around you does not mean you're allowing them to sin against you. Selflessness doesn't mean you're allowing them. So if you're in an abusive type relationship, if you're in a relationship where someone is sinning against you, there's nothing in Scripture that says you have to remain in that sin. You can do something about that. But on the daily, when it's just the regular offenses, our tendency is just to lash out. So what do we do? We'll, I'll tell you what we don't do. Christians, we don't respond to sin with sin. That's what we don't do. Now, what do we do? Second part of being selfless says this. Be gentle. Show perfect courtesy towards who? All people. You know, if he had just left off those last two words, this would have been a lot easier for me to preach. Because all people includes your enemies. All people includes those who hurt you 20 years ago and don't even know they hurt you. Gentle means this. You could be harsh. Courtesy means you could be rude, but in that moment, because you are remembering that you're supposed to be selfless, you choose to live like a Christian. That's what that means. All that to say, how do you even begin to do this? I mean, in a real, real talk, we all have that person who just lives rent free. You'd be out just doing the hedges. Next thing you know, you didn't have some whole imaginary conversation of what you would have said, you know? Or in the shower. What do you do? Well, I read this most fantastic quote online this week, and I think this person nailed it. it said, they said this, We do not have the kind of love we need for the difficult people in our lives. Facts? Whether they're family, friends, or strangers, what we must do is ask God to give us a supernatural love towards those difficult people. Remember, I'm one of those difficult people, and so are you. We need God Every second of every day. Thank you, Renee Steele, for putting that online this week. We got some wise people in this church. She's absolutely correct. She nailed it. That's what he's saying right here. Renee must be in Titus because that's what we're talking about. How do you do this? What's game pan three? How do you even begin? So look look at verse three here. It says this. Four. So the reason we can do this. Four. We ourselves were once foolish disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing out our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating another. It says this is who we used to be. And the word here, interestingly enough, foolish is a real fun word to camp out on. The word in Greek here is anatos. And what it doesn't mean is this. Foolish doesn't mean I went and got wiser. In this context, what foolishness means is uh, what, what it means foolish is it means this that truth has just been made known to you. See, a lot of times we think about, well, if I'm not going to be a fool anymore, I got to get wiser. What he's saying here is no, this is something that happened to you. The reason you're not a fool anymore is because something happened to you, it's not something that you did. When I was a kid, I snuck away one day while my parents were hanging out and I went to the back bedroom and I turned on TV and there was this fantastic movie about a doll baby called Child's Play. I think I was like four. There's this little doll called Chucky in there and he murders you. And I watched this whole thing and my parents didn't know until bedtime. Bedtime comes around, lights are off. I'm looking in the corner room. There's a murdering doll right there. I know it. Mom, what? I'm scared. Why? There's, something, there's nothing in my room. There's nothing there. Go back to bed. Look in the other corner. Well, there's two murderous dolls in the room. Mom finally comes in. She only does one thing. Flips on the light switch. Guess what I saw? It's my jacket. See, here's the thing. I didn't become wiser. I was just there in my own fear. My, my mother came. She gave me the light. And now I know the truth. This is what it means to not be foolish in Christ. We didn't do anything. Our God the Father sent His Son to us. We now have the light. We know the truth. And when I say that, I say that with a conviction because I know I'm speaking to my own self when I say Christians shouldn't live like fools when they know the truth. We shouldn't live like people who don't know what the hope that's out there. And I get it. We live in like a rather dark moment of history, at least I feel. I think most of us are kind of there. Like, the country's divided. Our culture celebrates sin. Our economy is not fantastic. But here's the thing. You know the ending. 
You've seen the light. You have the way. You just keep going. Because in the end, we win. Because one person on the team of Jesus is in the majority, correct? That's what it means. We remember who you were because in that we can be like Jesus and have that hope. And what is he, what is he going to say? He says, oh, we were also disobedient, misled, slaves to pleasure, evil and envy, hating each other. Do these characteristics just sound familiar as we look around? What it's talking about, this is the state of the natural man before Christ. And this is who we are supposed to be, not who we are. Now, what, what Paul is not doing, and we want to be very clear about this, Paul is not talking about unbelievers this way so we should hate them. That is not what he's doing. It's actually quite the opposite. It's to remind us of who we are without Jesus. That's all we are. We are simply our neighbors with, with Christ. We're simply the people who don't have Him with Him. And the fact is, we should want Him to have them. And what, what this should do for us is it should replace our arrogance towards the world with a compassionate humility towards the world. That we want them to know who we have. That we want them to have a new identity. And I get it right now. It's so like in fashion to be like, well, you can't identify with me. We're going to take this back this morning, okay? You can. Every single Christian you can identify with every other human's need for salvation. There's not one person you're going to meet who you can't identify because we all need Jesus Christ. And that is where we sit today. And, and you've seen it. You've seen it broken down. You've seen people cry. A few years ago, um, I mean, we don't, we don't talk around things. We'll just talk through them. A few years ago, remember when Donald Trump won? That was like a thing that happened. I uh, remember a video that came out. Some of y'all may have seen a video of people standing in the middle of the street, streets just screaming and crying and tearing their clothes off. Did any of y'all see this? I think it was a very popular video. Uh, it got sent to me like 15 times. And the first time I'm like, what is this? And then, you know, then other people was like laughing. But, but when I look at it through the lens of Scripture, do you know what we're witnessing when you watch people have mental breakdowns because a politician didn't win? You're watching their entire identity being stripped out of their soul. And they're this husk. And what else can you do but scream? And Christian, we have the answer for that fleeting identity that's found in this world. Amen. We have an answer that does not have an end because He is an eternal God. And if my identity is in Christ... They can never take away who I am. It doesn't matter who wins. It doesn't matter who loses because I know who is my king. That's where we get to sit. That's why we don't get crushed. And our world so needs that, doesn't it? And lastly, we got to remember one more thing. We remember who we were. But lastly, we get to remember one more thing. And this isn't necessarily a... A struggle memory, like losing weight. I look at it kind of like this. This past week was mine and my wife's anniversary, and I pulled out the old highlight video, okay? And I, I put it on the computer and watched it. And while I'm watching it, you know what I'm thinking? Man, I got her good, you know? But at the same time, it's a sweet memory because it's like, that's my girl. Sickness and health till death do us part. And that's the last memory that Paul is telling us to do, and that is this. We're to remember what Christ has done for us. Look at this. It says, But when the, goodness, when the goodness and loving kindness of our God and Savior appeared, He saved us, not because of the works done by us in righteousness, but according to His own mercy, by the washing and regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly through Jesus Christ our Savior, so that being justified by His grace, we may become heirs according to hope of eternal life. That's what we get to do. You having a hard day? You having a hard time getting it? Remember who you were, and then you remember what He did for you. Remember that even though He owed us nothing, He gave us everything. The word here for love is Philanthropia. Does that sound a little familiar? Philanthropy. It's not like a normal love 
like there, God loves us in every type of love, but I find it real interesting here that the love that's used is this philanthropic love, which means this. It's a, it's a concern that provokes action. That's what this is. It's a love that I love you so much, I'm going to do something about it. That's what he did. And that's the love he's instructed us to give this world. A love that's not passive. A love that doesn't just sit. A love that prepares for good works. And when we see this, what we see is that God set the standard for philanthropy through Jesus Christ. When He came and He gave us everything and He saved us. And what does He say here? He saved us not because of our works. No one ever strolled up to the cross on their own two feet. Everyone was carried to the cross in the nailed scar hands of Jesus. There is no one who can save themselves. There's no one who became wise enough. We are dead in our sin. What can dead people do? Nothing. If I said a dead person here five days from now, we come back five days from now, what are we going to find? Dead person, little more decayed, doing nothing. That is what we can do to merit our salvation, but God being rich in mercy, in that He doesn't give us the, the, what, the bad thing we deserve. Instead, He gives us grace through His Son, Jesus Christ, that by faith in Him, we can have salvation, we can have a new identity, we can have a hope, we can have a way to make it to tomorrow and make it through the next day. That's what this is about. He saves us completely. Eternal life begins the moment you become a Christian. Death is a hiccup. And now what do we get? We get this constant renewal of the Holy Spirit. That's quite important because let me ask you, how, many, how long do you think it's going to take before we uh, forget to put somebody else above us? How, how, many, how long do you think it's going to take before we get a little frustrated at our rulers and we feel like, man, I failed God again? That's the beauty of the Holy Spirit. When we do mess up, He is there to renew us. God doesn't want you sitting in your guilt. That's what the enemy does. Satan is called the accuser. He wants you to sit in your guilt. If you're here today and you have guilt, you are listening to Satan. Unless you don't know Jesus, then you might be listening to the Holy Spirit saying, come home, because you don't need that guilt. And, and what he does is he gives us that new start. And what does it say? We're justified. Like so many of us say, that's just like we've never sinned every day when you wake up. And honestly, this is the gospel, everybody. This is what, this is what we're about. This is what Christians are about. This is what every sermon should be about. If you hang out with a Christian long enough, I feel like Christians should be scratch and sniff stickers. You remember we talked about that? Scratch and sniff stickers. Do you remember these? I had them when I was a kid. You scratched it. It's like a Ninja Turtle. It's supposed to smell like a pizza. It smelled like feet. But you did get the smell. Listen, if someone hangs out with you long enough, they should get the gospel. And not just through our actions. Faith comes through hearing. They should hear it. And that's the beauty of the gospel, because we have the answer, the answer to identity. This is what Paul's writing them. Hey, Christians, guess what? Be the answer. Don't be the problem. So today, our application, real simple, is this. Remember. But it's important to remember when you need to remember, isn't it? So what I, what I do is I just offer a couple red flags, you know. Whenever you, you get a little fearful about what's going on with somebody who's in leadership over you, that is your red flag. Okay, God, where it, how do I submit in this situation? How do I do that? Because this is difficult. I don't want to. How do I do it? Even Jesus said, give to Caesars. What's the Caesars? God, how do I give to Caesar? What is Caesars? When you, when, you, when you got people around you being difficult, okay, how do I be selfless to these people? God, how, how do I Philippians 2, 3 this situation? How do I, how do I consider them more important than me? When you've, when you've got anxieties living rent-free in your head, that's a great red flag that you might need to remind yourself of the hope you have in Christ in your eternity. Or when you feel overwhelmed, that's your red flag. He has done it. The work's completed. And when you see the red flags, remind yourself of the truth. And this isn't like one of those catchy statements, but if I was just to try to summarize, a lot of what he's saying here is this. Christians do not wait until others deserve to be treated well. We don't wait. What if God waited until we deserved to be treated well? Exactly. We don't wait. I had a friend. She was a manager at Starbucks. All right? and, and it was here in Sumter. And she, she was a dear friend. And she came to me when it was uh, May. 
And she said, hey, Delmar, I need to talk to you. She's a believer. She goes, can we grab a, a table in the back of Starbucks? I'm like, yeah. And she said, I, I like working at Starbucks because I love people. I love serving people. She goes, but I am a Christian. And corporate has sent me this memo. They want me to sell these pride shirts for June, the month of June, to our staff. And aside from everything, just for every single person, can we collectively agree that pride is a sin? And then when we're celebrating sin with pride, that's like a sin sandwich. So she's, she said, I don't know what to do. My authorities have told me this, this is supposed to be, I'm supposed to sell these. So I don't know what I tell her. Just walk out of your job, tell Starbucks. They're going to be like, whatever. We didn't want you here anyways. So a couple, we prayed together. A couple weeks went by, I get there, it's June, I go in there, say hey to her. And I'm like, hey, how did, you, how did you handle that? She goes, okay, let me tell you. She said, so they sent me this little memo. And then I realized that we have this like small little announcement board in the, in the break room. And no one ever reads the announcements. You know how I know? Because they never do the things I tell them to do on the announcement boards. <laughs> She's like, but it is the official Starbucks mandated announcement board. So I pinned it up there and didn't have a problem. You know, her gut reaction was to get emotional. Her gut reaction was just a knee jerk. But when she sat in it, she said, no, I want to love these people here. These people at Starbucks need Jesus Christ. And, and what I love, and as I was thinking about her, she was really good of not letting her opinion of the culture outpace her testimony in the culture. So many times we let our opinions get out there farther than our faith. And what, what she did is she said, I'm just going to love these people. It wasn't an issue, but I'll tell you what was an issue. A few weeks later, I saw one of her people show up to church with her. And I'll tell you what, a few weeks later, I go to Starbucks, and they'd be like, you know, she is just the sweetest manager. And then a few months later, Starbucks decided to promote her. And then they moved her out of Sumter. And I don't know if I've been at Starbucks since. But I'll tell you this. When we find a way to navigate our culture with the gospel, it's a net positive for our, our culture. Let's pray. God, thank you for the hope that we have again. God, but also I thank you for the game plan. I thank you that you've shown up and you died on the cross and you've told us what to do. And God, we readily admit it's very difficult. We readily admit um, that we need your help. But God, just like you, uh, you saved us with your grace. I pray that you would sustain us daily with it, that you would call us to be a people who live like you, no matter what's going on. It's in Jesus' name. Amen.